board member Carolyn, when you do have the opportunity, we have the microphone indicators on the screen for you. The red microphone is muted. The gray microphone, even though it's strike through, means that you're unmuted. So when you have. Good morning, Carolyn. I see your microphone is unmuted. And board member Carolyn McAloon, if you have problems with the audio on your computer, there is a slide on the screen showing how to call in with your cell phone at the same time so that you can participate by audio. This way you'll be able to speak and to vote. This is Brian. Did we ever get Carolyn to do a mic check? We're working with her now and we have not successfully heard her speak yet. Okay. Good morning, members of the public. Welcome to the Podiatric Medicine Medical Board of California board meeting. We are finalizing issues with getting all of our board members logged in and audible. We will be beginning the meeting in just a few moments. Thank you. Good morning, it's Carolyn. Can you hear me now? Wonderful. Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I apologize for the difficulty. I could hear no. you fine and I was <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. I think uh, we're all in agreement. We, we can start the meeting. Yeah, this is Brian Naslin, the uh, executive uh, officer of the Podiatric Medical Board. This is our June 5th, 2020 full board meeting. Uh, Dr. Manzi, who is the president, you have a full board and all participants are logged in. 
So if you want to go ahead and start, um, we will start with doing a roll call and Kathy will be taking that roll call. Great, good morning um, everyone. Um, welcome to our June 5th, 2020 board meeting uh, via WebEx. Um, in order to do our call to order on our establishment of quorum, would you prefer that we each unmute our microphone and say present um, when um, the names are called? During the meeting, if you're not speaking, you know, I really would ask everyone to mute their microphone um, just so the background noise can be kind of held to a minimum. If you want to say something, there's a hand raising um, ability that we've all reviewed. So also just do that and I'll try to be uh, cognizant of that. Okay, so um, we're ready now to take roll call. Okay, good morning everyone. This is Kathy Cooper. Uh, Dr. Judith Mandy. Present. Darlene Elliott. Present. Maria Cadenas. Present. Dr. Neil Mansdorf. Present. Dr. Carolyn McAloon. Hello? Okay, so Dr. McAloon, we didn't get a response. Is, is that what everyone else is hearing too? Yes, I think she's having sort of technical difficulty here. Okay, Dr. Michael Hello. Zapp. Can you Present. hear me now? Yes, Dr. McAloon, we can hear you. Okay, great. I'm not sure why you can't, why I'm going in and out. Sorry. Okay, and then Dr. Zapp, I heard a yes from you too. <laughs> okay, so you have a quorum, Dr. Manzi. Great, thank you. So, mm -hmm. um, welcome everyone once again. I hope everyone's um, staying safe and sound where they're sheltering in place. Um, the board um, may not discuss or take actions on any matters raised during this public. We're going to have a public comment session now, okay? So, um, we uh, may not discuss or take any actions or matters raised during this public comment section except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of future meetings. So I'm going to ask for, um, is this the area now that we ask for a public comment, right? Yes. <laughs> if there's any members of the public out there um, and you would like to make a comment, could you please raise your hand? Good morning. This is the moderator. Um, Welcome. Before we get started, I did want to go through how public comment is going to be managed so the members of the public are aware how they are going to participate. So if that's okay, uh, Board President, I would like to go through the instructions. Sure. sure. Thank you. So um, to facilitate public comment, we will be using the WebEx question and answer feature. When the board president reaches the point in the agenda which public comment is appropriate, public comment will be requested. At the board's direction, we will turn on the, and announce the opening of the Q&A feature. Members of the public can indicate they would like to make a comment by clicking on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of their WebEx screen. These instructions are also on the screen for your reference. In the Ask field, typically in the lower right of the WebEx screen, members of the public who wish to make a comment will type, I would like to make a public comment, and send it to all panelists. Any other communications will not be responded to. It is not necessary to identify yourself in order to make a public comment. I will be taking the comments in the order that they are received, and I will call on the members of the public to unmute their microphone. Please note that the Q&A feature is being used only as a means for the members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. Once unmuted, the members of the public may verbally state their comments. 
This is not a means to ask questions of the moderator or members of the board. This is not a means um, for the members of the board to have conversations amongst each other as well. Such inquiries submitted will not be answered. If any attendees utilize profane names in their displays or language, they will simply be unmuted or asked to remove themselves from the meeting and come back in with professional display names. So at this moment, we will open the Q&A. And members of the public, if you are interested in submitting a public comment, please type in, I would like to make a public comment and send it to our panelists, and we will call on you. I'll give you a moment. Board President, there's no request for a public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The Q&A feature has been closed. Great. Okay. So now I would like to review uh, and approve the March 6, 2020 board meeting minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review them? Is anyone like to make a motion uh, regarding them? This is Maria Cadena, so moved. Great. Do I have a second? Michael Zapp seconds. Great. Okay. Good. So um, now we have to uh, say all in favor, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, we need a roll call. Okay, so um, Kathleen, if you can start a roll call, that'd be great. Okay, so Dr. Manzi. Uh, yes. Darlene Elliott. Yes. Maria Cadenas. Yes. Dr. Neil Mansdorf. Yes. Dr. Carolyn McAloon. Oh boy. This is the moderator. I will unmute her microphone. Yes. <laughs> okay. And Dr. Michael Zapp. Yes. Okay, so unanimous. Okay. And uh, now um, Brian Aslan will give us um, um, a possible action in our uh, executive office report. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Manzi. Um, what I'd like to do is jump down to the legislative regulatory prog uh, program. Uh, Clay Jackson is going to be reporting on that, but Clay has another meeting at 1030, uh, another board meeting. So if we can jump out of uh, order here, we'll just hear item C, number two. So Kathy and Clay. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Uh, if you could look at attachment F, these are the changes to uh, the AB, one, AB 2138 regulations that seem to be going on forever. Uh, at, this was originally intended to go during your March meeting and because we didn't get these revisions in our office until late, they were unable to be agendized for that meeting. So Ileana is still with us, as you'll note, on attachment F, and she made these changes that I'm now bringing to you. Uh, these changes are the result of uh, negotiations between the OAL, the Office of Administrative Law, and our office uh, based on some revisions that came about in the vet med package that, that our office was hoping would fly through OEL back in November. Uh, the package was ultimately withdrawn and these changes were made at the end of January uh, by the vet med board 
and to date that package nor any other AB 2138 package has made its way through the Office of Administrative Law. So as we sit here today, um, we're bringing these, these revisions, which are the ones that have the comments, also the, the ones in the packet that are either double strike through or double underline. And so that's really all we're talking about today since the rest of the revisions were made by the board uh, last year. So just summarizing Ileana's comment, uh, starting in 1399.659.1, uh, substantial relationship criteria, under A, uh, subdivision E was added, uh, section 2234, just so that so that specifics that were deemed substantially related would be added. Uh, moving down to B, uh, there's the non-substantial changes that were done, and a lot of these OAL felt were either vague or just needed to be made more specific. So things such as getting rid of a person holding the certificate and making it specific to the nature and duties of the profession, which the applicant seeks, seeks licensure, was deemed to be, uh, although nonspecific, more understandable to the person reading the regulation. Moving down to criterion for rehabilitation, Again, just looking at the double underlined, numerous non-substantial changes. I'd like to note that in talking about rehabilitation, rehabilitation is an entire process under which a convicted felon individual goes through so merely getting parole or finishing one sentence does not provide someone with a certificate of rehabilitation. They must go through the rehabilitation process in order to obtain that. So whenever you see this or consider in the future the, the criteria for rehabilitation, it's important that you know and understand that the person has that certificate, has obtained, has gone through that process. So, so it, it, it uh, makes it more understandable to you when you see that in the future. The next is under B as in boy, and when it talks about the uh, what's listed as two, by the way, under, uh, you see that B was double, double struck, struck out on the left side and changed to uh, the number two. That actually should have remained B, so I've changed that back. So it would be a non-substantive change because it's just, it's just uh, changing the formatting, but it is non-substantial. And so adding those code sections are substantial and they're just for specificity so that someone would know where to look were they to be reading this section. Also, the uh, people in OAL, the attorneys in OAL do not like catch-alls and this goes back and forth in the law. Sometimes you'll find that Attorneys will just say, oh, just make it, you know, as set forth above, or here, if section A is, is inapplicable, and then OAL has changed that to, you need to be specific, you need to list specific code sections, and you need to say specifically if they have not completed the criminal sentence, as opposed to if section A is inapplicable. So that you'll see go back and forth in your regulations as you follow them throughout your careers. Uh, 
all of the gray are non-substantial changes uh, going to uh, B2. There's a substantial change that was made because of a change in C2 that's below here. Going on to C, under C1 and 2, there's uh, the same type of changes as above, uh, where they struck out. Once again, if, sub if subsection C is inapplicable, they got rid of that. And I'd like you to note that there was a there was a revision in item C2, and because because uh, the lettering was changed, I changed in in the in C2. Um, I think it said it said D1. I changed that to C1 because of the renumbering and relettering of, of the sections. And that's it unless there's any questions. This is Brian Naslin again. So what the board needs to do is accept these amendments and take action and then we can move the package forward. Okay, so um, I have one quick question. This, um, the, these are just sort of cleanups of languages uh, of the existing, you know, um, regulation, I guess, or um, instruction for what happens with, um, you know, denial of license, et cetera. Um, this, so I don't see that there's anything like, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's a lot of legal, uh, you know, jargon that I really don't understand completely. So correct me if it's wrong, this has, it hasn't really substantially changed any specific uh, action, I guess, against the person that's being reprimanded. Uh, overall, the, this did change quite a few things, but what you're being asked to to revise today didn't change anything from what Ileana discussed with you last year when you when you passed the original when you approved the original language. Okay. So no changes. So the I guess and this this document, as I understand it, has nothing to do with the fact of um, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of questions, and I can ask it after we vote on this, I guess, because I don't think this has anything to do with it. But when the person gets their license um, or an action taken on them about, with the board about posting this letter in their office um, regarding the fact that this action has been taken, because I know with the MD board, they don't have that regulation in, and the podiatry board somehow still does. Brian, do you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, I think you got two things confused. I think you're talking about AB 1448 okay. that we are, we, are, we submitted into our sunset to have that amended in that statute uh, so included with MDs and DOs. So something a little bit different, and uh, we're currently working on tr trying to find a pathway for that to happen this year. But um, with the COVID right now, um, the legislature are not really taking on any other kind of bills. Um, so at this point, uh, we're still trying um, to see if we can find an avenue to make that correction on that statute. So okay. this, is, um, this is a little bit different. This is AB 2138. And, okay. Uh, yeah. I would make the motion to accept these changes. Answer a second. Okay, great. So does anybody have any discussion on this further? Uh, we're going to have to take a, a roll call, and, um, and then after that we'll do discussion. Okay. So if, uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I might. 
Yes. Yeah. You also want. Hello? Go this back. is for Chan Yu. Um, so, is, is, is my understanding of right now the board is voting for the motion itself to adopt the changes, or is the board just voting to discuss this right now? Could someone repeat that? Yeah, Fred, breaking up. Yeah, there you go. You're better. Okay. So my question is, is the board right now voting on the motion to adopt these changes? Yes. Well, okay, then I would recommend that the board open it up for public comments prior to okay. taking a vote on this motion. Okay. okay. Also, you. Also, this is Clay. Sorry, who's you speaking? Also, you also. This is Clay Jackson. You also right want you. That was Fred Chanyu from from Legal Affairs. He's your attorney. Oh, your board counsel. Okay. okay. And you also you. want to to have the motion include the ability of the executive officer and staff to make any uh, non-substantive grammatical or or uh, procedural revisions, such as renumbering or fixing spelling errors, things like that. So those don't have to come back before the board into the motion. Okay, so I'd like to read the motion as I heard it. Um, so you accept so the what's the let's do public comment first. So Dr. Manzi, if you want to open it up for public comment and then uh okay. go so ahead. Is there any public comment regarding this California Code of Regulation proposed language? This is the moderator. I will now open it up for public comment. So I'm opening up the QA feature. The instructions are on the screen. And again, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within, located within the square at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. Type in, I would like to make a public comment, and we will call on you. No requests were submitted, Board President. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. And I would like to make a quick reminder, board members and staff, when you're not speaking, if you can please mute your microphone. If I do detect background noise, I will mute the microphone from my end. Um, also, when you are introducing or when you're going to speak, if you can please introduce yourself by name, first and last name, so members of the public know who is speaking, and also for meeting minute purposes. Thank you very much. Okay, so there was no public comment regarding this. So once again, I make a motion. Um, oh, well, Kathleen, can you read back the motion, please? Yes, I will. It's to accept the text as presented in attachment F and to allow the executive officer and staff to make any non-substantive grammatical or procedural changes. Thank you. Do I have mm -hmm. a second on that motion? That was Mansdorf, Dr. Mansdorf. Okay. Fine. Um, now can we take a, a vote on this, Kathleen? Yes. Okay. Dr. Manzi. Aye. Ms. Elliott. Aye. Ms. Cadenas. Aye. Dr. Mansdorf. Aye. Dr. McAloon. Aye. Dr. Zass. Aye. Okay, unanimous pass. Okay. And this is Brian Naslin, uh, Executive Officer. And did, did, was there any discussion uh, uh, with the board members about this? Okay, sounds like we're uh, good, Dr. Nancy. Okay, great. So, Brian, do you have anything more? And when do we bring back our other discussion on the uh, pro, um, possible actions, I guess, because of – we'll reopen it, I guess, for the other things to discuss on this uh, in this agenda portion? 
Um, yes, we can talk about that in our in our sunset update. Okay, fine. All right. So, um, do you have anything else um, that you um, want to report at this point? And that would be Mr. Jackson, if you want to. Um, I think that's what you were going to talk about, right? Yes, that, that's what I was going to talk about. And uh, Kathleen has got the rest of the items in okay. in this section. So okay. thank, thank you very much. And thanks for um, for doing that uh, uh, for us. And uh, we'll be in communication. And good luck on your next meeting. Thank you. Thanks all. Okay. So let's. Uh, this is Brian Aislin again. Let's go ahead and jump back up to um, the regular agenda. Start at A licensing program, which the chair is um, Dr. Manzi. Right. Okay. So um, the licensing program report um, and the licensing statistics. I'm going to let um, Andrea um, take it from here. Hi, good morning. This is Andrea Damian, who is the licensing coordinator for the PMBC. And we'll start with the licensing statistics during the third quarter of fiscal year 1920 between January 1st and March 31st. There were 29 newly licensed DPMs for quarter three. Um, we currently have 28 pending applications with two candidates that recently completed their package. And so far for fiscal year 1920, PMBC had 15 of the applicants come from out of state, <clears throat> 26 were third year residents from California, and 34 were third year residents from an out of state program. Next is renewals. In the month of January, there were 73 renewals mailed with 66 licenses renewed by end of month. February had 104 renewals mailed with 93 licenses renewed by end of month, and March had 91 renewals mailed with 78 licenses renewed by end of month. Delinquent notices went out 30 days after expiration to those who had not met requirements. <clears throat> Next for the residents, there was one new resident added to the third year resident rotation list, which brings the resident license total count to 125. And then we have the calendar. Is there any questions on the statistics? I don't have any questions on the statistics, but um, so let's um, let's see. Do we have to we have to um, accept these? Correct. Uh, but I, I do I do have a few questions on just going forward. I don't know if we want to talk about this now or wait. Brian, what's your suggestion? Oh, this is Brian Nason again. Um, up to you. Um, if you want to have, uh, are, is this for future agenda items? Uh, no, it's just some questions about um, what's currently going on in licensing. Okay, uh, you can have that discussion now. Okay. So, Andrea, I have a couple questions. One is, when you say that there's 28 pending applications and two have recently completed their packages mm -hmm. for the licensing statistics for you know this quarter, and that is for this quarter, correct? Uh, yes, up at, yeah. up okay. the last quarter. When you say that the, um, the, that two candidates recently completed their packages, is one of the requirements for the completion of the package um, for the new license to get their certificate from their residency director of the residency completion? Yes. And is this, um, uh, what is accepted for that? I, I, I um, Is it just like, Yes, he's going to graduate July first, or he, or he, you know, he, he will complete it June whatever, or it as it has been completed. Like, what is acceptable? Uh, so there's a form on our website under the applications section. It's a P4, and it's mm -hmm. it's titled a certificate of approved residency training, and it's two pages where it has the um, applicant's name the dates they were in the program, and there's a few questions for the director to answer. Mm -hmm. um, so they just complete both of those pages and then send it in directly from the program. The applicant can't submit that form. Right. So it's really, if there is a holdup, 
um, because I, 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 I've been asked this question. And in, it's usually at this point, if that's the holdup, it's in the hands of the residency director, correct? Like they, for some reason, hasn't given you this form yet, if that's one of the things that can hold it up. It could be that. It could be they haven't paid the fee or we haven't received their scores or a license verification. It could be a few different reasons why it's not being approved. And also when I say that there's two recently completed packages, that could mean that they're waiting to be licensed until their birth month or maybe they're currently a second year resident, but they haven't quite finished the full two years. So we have to wait for them to finish and then they'll be issued in July. Um, yeah, so that's, I guess, more the question. Like, so until the, whether or not they've completed all their requirements and there's a date that ends the residency, well, or completes the residency, I suppose. That yeah, is, so they, they won't fit fully complete their second, years in, second year until after June 30th. Whatever. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, um, that's good to know. And then my other question is, um, is your, so as far as, um, since we have a staggered renewal system in California, because it's tied to your birth date, um, I've had this discussion, I think, with you before, but I think it'd be good to clarify for the board. Um, we're, um, we, we're not really, um, I shouldn't say not affected by COVID-19, but we are processing the renewals in a timely fashion. We're, we don't, you don't see this onslaught back up, do you? I haven't seen it, especially since we have the online renewals. That's helped a lot with being able to, you know, if somebody, the license renewal got lost in the mail, we can just direct them to the website and it's instantaneous. As soon as they pay the fee, they can renew the license. Or if someone's having issues, they'll leave messages. And, um, you know, I've been getting back to them to walk them through that process and on how to renew online. And can you clarify, just so the board's aware, of what we are now doing regarding our CMEs? Uh, we accept all CMEs to be done online. So mm -hmm. um, they are able to do online CMEs, all 50 of them. And we do have a waiver if for some reason there's, you know, still not able to get the full 50 hours, they can complete that waiver application to get an extension for another two years. Great. And um, also, uh, to make it clear to everyone, this is pretty uh, obvious on our website, this information. Correct? There is a section on continuing competence, the law section, and what um, organizations are approved and right. 50 hours. <clears throat> but the idea that, you know, there is this waiver acceptance and there is this online acceptance, this is clearly on our website somewhere so people can find this information? Yeah, the application for CME waiver is under our form section. I believe on the homepage there was, um, when this all first started, there is links to the executive orders and Great. DCA waivers, more information. It's right on the homepage. And um, I noticed with the new bill that went out for um, license renewal and, um, you know, that there was, you know, it went up from like what the, total cost was, uh, I saw the increase in fee come through, correct? I'm sorry, what was the, the last so, part? The for instance, I just received, we just received our, uh, um, the, 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 the licensing fee uh, has an increase in cost now, correct? Um, the only fee I'm aware of that's changing, I believe, in October is the cures fee will be going up. So, but no other fees have changed? Internally, as far as renewals, nothing has changed. Okay, great. All right. As of yet. I have nothing else to say here. Does anybody else want to say anything? Okay, so I'd make a motion to... Um, do we, uh, this is Brian again. Uh, Fred, do we need to do a public comment on this? Oh, sorry. Hey, Brian, yes. Uh, well, it's up to the, the board. Um, you guys can wait. And I don't know. You oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, this is Fred Chan Yu. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Now we can. Okay, this is Fred Chan Yu from DCA Legal. Um, it's up to um, the board president how you would like to handle the public comment for this 
item, you can wait until um, A1, 2, and 3 are discussed before you open up to public comments because it sounds like to me it's more of an update more than anything. However, if any action is supposed to, if the board is going to take any action, I would recommend that the board open it up for public comments before taking any actions, before voting on any actions. So, um, just to clarify, so right now, um, Madam President, you can wait until item A1, 2, and 3 are done before open up for public comments, or you can do A1, open up for public comments, tackle A2, open up to public comments, and then tackle A3 and then open up for public comments. Very much. I think what we'll do is we're going to go right through all three of them and then we'll open up for public comment. So the licensing statistic report is completed. Um, now um, you want to move on to calendar, Andrea? Um, the PMBC calendar? Yes. Is there any questions? It's just there as like a. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> <laughs> informational. It's informational and probably be on a web app. Um, okay, so everyone else who's not speaking, please mute your microphone because I get a lot of background music going on here. Also, um, let's go on now for any uh, possible action or recommendation for approval of um, our California Podiatric Residency Programs for the academic year. Okay, there's 19 separate California postgraduate clinical training programs that are seeking approval of applications for residency programs offered for the 2020-2021 academic year. Um, they're all the same programs as last year. There's just two that have a name change. The Adventist Health White Memorial, formerly White Memorial, and LA Downtown Medical Center, formerly Silver Lake Medical Center. Okay. Um, the, um, the only discussion um, I'm going to bring up here is um, the COVID-19 has really put a big uh, impact on all the residency programs in two specific ways. Um, one is, um, and this is just a, for an informational report, by the way. Um, one is the fact that um, all, all elective surgeries were shut down for a while, and now they're coming back, um, which decreased some of the surgical numbers for some of these programs. Um, it, since it's only been a few months, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't affect it, uh, the overall training over the long run of things, but it is something that, you know, we all need to be kind of aware of. The other thing that's happened is the, the inability for the medical students, um, which is a whole other story, um, to show up as externs in these programs. Um, so they've been disallowed essentially to participate um, in, in these programs, and many of them have externships. So it's just something to be aware of, and it's been happening you know, for the last three months, and I don't know going forward what's going to happen with the July externs. Um, the newer recommendation is if they're coming from out of state and they can't actually drive to the externship program where they're sheltering in place, then they may not be allowed to do it. However, all the incoming residents will be starting in July. So as far as I know, the programs are hindered only in the, the way that they, they've had some decrease in volume in their elective surgeries. And that's just a comment. Um, Okay, so I am now. Do we have any public comment on anything regarding the licensing program? Now you can open it up for that. This is the moderator. I see board member Neil has his hand oh. up. Sure, Neil. Hi, this is Neil Mansdorf. Uh, we may want to wait until it's time for discussion or after a motion has been passed. It, it just had to do with one of the residencies being approved. So I don't know whether you want me to ask the question now or wait until we have a, a motion. I think uh, you can go ahead and talk about it now. I just noticed that Fountain Valley is on probation, and maybe uh, Andrea can answer the question as to if she knows anything as to why the program is on probation. So I looked on, um, if, you look at, if you go to the CPME website, you can look at all the program links to who's approved in California. And so on the Fountain Valley 
page, they list um, non-compliance standards. And so it looks like theirs was 5.3, 7.1, and 7.2. Um, and then I was looking at their program standards and requirement document, which is a checklist that I believe they use when they review all the programs. And so would you like me to read you the 5.3, 7.1, and 7.2? Yes. Okay. Um, 5.3 is under standard five, which says the program director shall be responsible for the administration of the residency and all participating institutions. The program director shall be able to devote sufficient time to fulfill the responsibilities required of the position. The program director shall ensure that each resident receives equitable training experiences. Under standard 7.1, says the program director shall review, evaluate, and verify resident logs on a monthly basis. And 7.2 is the faculty and program director shall assess and validate on an ongoing basis the extent to which the resident has achieved the competencies. Um, I had actually reached out to CPME as well to, for clarification on whether this program is you know, going to be approved for this next training year. And Yesterday afternoon, um, they weren't able to tell me because they had to notify the program first, um, but I did get notification yesterday that it is an approved program for the next training year. This is Neil Mansdorf. Thank you very much, Andrea. You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is Judy Manzi again. Uh, the, the thing is about those um, evaluation uh, forms. I know that uh, you know, a lot of it is uh, housekeeping, uh, and it is frustrating because we only have so much control over, I guess, that and that particular part of it. And if the Council on Podiatric Medical Education is going to continue to, I guess, improve these. Um, you know, it would be something for us now to keep in mind um, and maybe look into it again if, in fact, you know, they haven't, I guess, solved this problem. But I don't know. So what Neil brings is a very good point uh, up regarding these programs. As long as we're doing our guess, our diligence of making sure that CPME is still approving it, I guess we're going to, you know, I, I would recommend we just go ahead and continue with the approval, unless anyone else has any other discussion regarding it. Okay, so um, I guess we can, um, <laughs> is there any more, is there any public, we already, is there any public discussion regarding anything on the licensing program? This is the moderator. I'll be opening up the Q&A feature. So at this moment, if you would like to make a public comment, please uh, click on the icon. I have the screen um, with the instructions and type in, I would like to make a public comment and send it to all panelists. I'll pause for a moment. Board President, no public comment requests were received. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please do. Thank you. It is closed. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, let's move on to enforcement program report. This is you Brian. Okay. Yeah, this is Brian Nason. Um, what needs to happen here is a motion to um, approve these programs for academic year 2020 through 2021-19. So we need to have a, a motion out there. Michael Zapp makes the motion. For second. And who was that second? Was that Dr. Mons? Or <laughs> I 
Okay, so is the motion to accept residency applications for the academic year 2021? That's the motion? I think? Yes. Okay. And that was made by Dr. Zapp, seconded by Dr. Mansdorf. Okay, Dr. Manzi. Sorry, this is uh, illegal. Yeah. Um, prior to any type of vote, I would recommend um, giving the public a chance to comment on the language of the motion if they have any thought about the motion itself. So I would recommend just going back to public comment before taking the vote. Wait, I'm just not understanding. We just did public comment, right, on this right. same motion. Right, so but, but, but the public comment uh, session was, was offered before the motion was made. Okay, so future, we shouldn't do our public comment until after the motion? Is that would be my recommendation, yes. Okay, so can we open up public comment again to approve the language of this motion, please? Yes, this is the moderator. The Q&A feature has been opened. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen and type in, I would like to make a public comment and send it to all panelists. And we haven't re received a request for public comment. Board President, would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. It has been closed. Okay, Kathleen, um, want to read back the motion and, um, or do we have to make a new motion, Mr. Um, um, John? The spread is fine. The spread is fine. Right. Do we uh, have no, you don't, you don't need to, um, you don't need to uh, say anything. I mean, you just take the vote right now since there's no uh, public comments made. Uh, it's fine to reread the motion for the board members. That's fine. Okay, so I'm going to take your vote. Dr. Manzi. Aye. Ms. Elliott. Aye. Ms. Cadena. Aye. Dr. Mansdorf. Aye. Dr. McAloon. Aye. And Dr. Zapp. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Mansdorf, do you want to move on to the enforcement program update and possible action, please? I think because uh, this Neil Mansdorf, because Bethany is in attendance, she can probably breeze through it faster. Uh, she's also quite familiar with the data. So I'll pass that on to Bethany. Bethany here. I have. Oh, crap, did I just hang up? Oh. Can everyone hear me? What is wrong? Yes, here? we can hear you. Okay, sorry. I was trying to put myself on speaker so I could be hands free for getting the report. <laughs> I thought I might have hung up on accident for a second. <laughs> so my portion of the report covers enforcement from January 1st through March 31st, 2020. This is the third quarter. I'm going to start with the statistics. <clears throat> um, so starting with the complaint data, third quarter complaint data is provided. 45 complaints were received between January 1st and March 31st. This was an 8% decrease compared to third quarter of last year when 49 complaints were received. Again, we have the average days to close or assign a case at nine days, which is within the DCA target of 10 days. <clears throat> Moving on to investigation data, during the third quarter, 41 desk investigations were assigned. That's a 7% decrease over the third quarter of last year. 35 desk investigations were completed a 17% increase and the processing time decreased 17% with an average of 76 days. The investigations assigned to the field were eight for the third quarter. This is a 14% increase from last year uh, when seven cases were assigned to the field. And eight field investigations were completed, which is the same as third quarter of last year. 
there was a 49% decrease in field investigation processing time, which is really good. That means that our new investigators are starting to get these cases closed. Um, when we were having a staff shortage before. So we show for all case investigation times, includes desk and field investigations, are averaging 170 days to complete, which is still above the DCA target of 125 days. Um, although later, if you look at the um, other report that shows quarters one through three, we're still looking pretty good. 58% um, of the complaints were closed within 90 days, 30% completed between um, 91 days and one year, and 12% took over one year to complete. For disciplinary data, we had one new case initiated during the third quarter, which is a 67% decrease over third quarter of last year when we had three. One final order went into effect compared to two last third quarter, and we're, our single case took 1,579 days to complete, which was over four years, which is very lengthy. Um, this particular case went to hearing, and so it extended the process. And at this time, there are two final orders being held for board discussion during closed session today. <clears throat> we had no citations issued during the third quarter. Last third quarter, there was one. We had no new probationers added, although one probationer did successfully complete. And at the end of quarter three, there were seven active probationers. And then we, I'm starting to include those who have public letters of reprimand with conditions. So there's five individuals currently being tracked with um, conditions they need to complete as part of their public letter of reprimand. <clears throat> Moving on to um, attachment D, which is the summary of the current fiscal year statistics, quarters one through three. So we're showing um, for a complaint intake, average days to close or assign for the whole year so far is a 20% increase over last year. It's taking an average of 12 days, so those first couple of quarters um, did were a little bit over. And um, we had some NBC staffing issues during that time that was contributing to those intake delays. Total investigations have uh, assigned has decreased 6%. And case closures match the prior year with 120 cases closed by the end of quarter three. Our average days to complete investigations is 136 days, very close to the target of 125 days, and just a 4% increase over the same period last year. We had a total of six disciplinary cases initiated through the AG's office um, for quarters one through three so far, same as last year. <clears throat> Four final orders have been issued to date this fiscal year compared to three uh, last year. And our average disciplinary case completion time is 1,177 days. This is over double the DCA target set of 540 days. Um, however, it has gone down still 17% over the last period last year. Um, this is something that has been pretty consistent with going over the DCA target, uh, especially for uh, the AG cases. Um, this is actually something pretty common throughout the various boards and bureaus. I did check with DCA uh, to see what the possibility would be to change these um, targets. And they did tell me that for the um, performance measure four, which is the AG cases, this is set for all boards and bureaus and we actually do not have the option <laughs> to adjust this target. Um, at this time, so I don't know if other boards may at some point in the future call for this, but at this time it's not an option. So we're just going to be, I guess, over the average days, uh, we're doing our best to move these cases along. Um, again, it's still unknown what COVID-19 may, um, the effect it may have on our uh, case times. At this time, I am not seeing um, too much change in the investigation and AG portions. I'm still seeing movement on those cases, um, investigations closing, investigations being uh, sent over to the AGs and um, uh, legal cases coming through. However, I have noticed a decrease in complaints coming across my desk and I do believe that we may be seeing some impact here based on so many employees working from home and additional um, staffing issues and ability to manage um, staff that are doing the complaint intake process. 
I'm in communication with medical board um, about that and we'll let you know of any progress made. Um, so citations, two citations have been issued the first three quarters of this year compared to three last year and the average days to complete a citation, this looks um, really huge, 1,394% <laughs> increase. But the reason for this is that depending on where the citation um, initiates from, it may be a probation probationer that has an issue and it takes us one day to issue that citation or it may come from a lengthy field investigation that they determine a citation and find is the best way to close out um, that complaint. So this particular um, cite and fine uh, was a individual that came from a um, investigation and the prior year were mostly um, ones that were able to be initiated fairly quickly through our office. And moving on to the Attorney General case aging data, that is um, attachment E. <laughs> this is information received from the AG's office through May 7th of 2020. We had no new accusations filed during the third quarter. One final order went into effect and there are currently 12 active cases pending completion at the AG's office. One of these cases is a non-administrative appeal case. Um, there are some cases that have been forwarded to the AG's office, but they have not yet been formally accepted. They're pending either criminal convictions or um, additional investigation that is needed at this time. Um, for segment F, performance measures, there's no new information to report since the last data of fiscal year 2018 and 2019 was reported. We're waiting for DCA to um, gather that data and it, um, update their website. Um, again, performance measures two complaint data and four discipline data are global and cannot be revised. However, if the board would like to entertain any discussion to update or revise performance measure three investigation times, um, there is room for that discussion. And that concludes my statistical report. Does anyone have any questions on these statistics? Hi, this is Neil Mansdorf. Can we put that on the agenda for the next board meeting to uh, look at a, a, a reasonable date, or not date, um, timeline uh, to consider when, when those um, cases should be completed by? reasonable range, that, I guess. Would that be just for performance measure three, the one we have any control over? That's exactly right. Okay, perhaps I can get somebody from DCA to come and speak about that as well. That'd be great. Okay. Um, thank you. Also, um, is there any chance that, um, do you remember when we did our, um, our looked at the past five physical years of discipline data and we looked at like um, the gender, the when they got their license, their podiatric school graduation, their residency program, et cetera. Um, is there any a way that we could um, either keep it ongoing that once these cases are out in the field and there's an action actually taken and completed um, that we keep track of those as well in that same um, way that we did with our look back over five years? Yes, and I was planning actually on doing that once a year at the end of the fiscal year, so it would be included in the next report for the fourth quarter. Thank you. Any other question on the enforcement statistics? Okay. <clears throat> I will move on to the probation program update. $52,344.50 was collected in cost recovery and probation monitoring costs in the third quarter. Um, the average to, uh, of collection was $11,295 over the past five years, so we're way above that this time. Um, <clears throat> probably due to more lump sum payments being made, due to people being able to pay online with a credit card, and also because the probation billing went out a little bit later, we've been receiving more of that um, during the third quarter instead of the second quarter. 
any questions on the probation program itself or the cost recovery? Okay. I will move on to the third item. This is the consultant and expert program update. We had training, consultant training originally scheduled for June 26 to be um, concurrent with the Western Foot and Ankle Conference. The conference has now been moved online, um, but I have canceled the training itself and I'm considering either doing individual phone or web-based um, or web-based training, so either individually on the phone in order to get them up and running right away and then to try and develop a um, maybe a Zoom type of meeting for a future consultant training, um, possibly before the end of this year or early next year. Um, and moving on to the consultant and expert applications, we have two applications at this time for a podiatric medical consultant. They have been received, they meet the qualifications per the board policy, um, and their CVs are presented for your review. I did um, do reference checks on both candidates. I was able to reach three individuals for one candidate and two for the other um, glowing reviews for both. This is Neil Mansdorf. I can speak to both of these candidates, Dr. Devin Glazer and Dr. Nicholas Todd are both outstanding candidates. Uh, both excellent podiatrists, very familiar with podiatric medical care, as well as the science. They would be ex excellent uh, consultants, uh, and I would make a motion to approve. We'll do them uh, both together um, unless there's any uh, discussion to separate them, but I can tell you both would be good candidates uh, as consultants for the board, so the motion is to approve both Dr. Devin Glazer and Dr. Nicholas Todd as consultants for the Podiatric Medical Board. California. This is Dr. Yeah. McAloon. I second Dr. Mansdorf's motion and include that um, I hold belt gentlemen in high regard and recruited them both for full disclosure. Okay, thank um, you. I agree. This is, oh, go this ahead. is from BCA Legal. Um, because it's two separate applications, I would recommend that the motion, that we two separate motions, one for each. Thank you. Okay. I will so modify my motion to first approve Dr. Devin Glazer as a consultant for the Podiatric Medical Board of California. I will second that motion. Um, this is Fred again. Um, just for those keeping track uh, at home uh, for the next public comments, it would be for um, the motions and also for any of the items that were covered under Section B. Okay, so enforcement program. Not, you want the public comment before the motion now or after the motion? No, well, the motion has been made. So I guess the, the, the public comments will come in now. And just to, just to specify, um, the public comment can cover the motions and also anything else that was discussed under enforcement program. I, again, this is just for the record. This is just for the record, so it's clear. Okay, so should we make all our motions now or just in before we open the public comment and now we open it after each motion? I think now is the time. Um, there are two motions on the table right now. So public comment can, can go ahead. And then after public comment, there'll be then a vote taken for each of the motions. Oh, this is Brian Aislinn. So um, go ahead, Dr. Uh, uh, okay. Can you, can you guys hear me now? Now we can. Okay. What you say? Yeah, so um, Dr. Manzi, I think you should just open this up for all um, agenda items B of the enforcement program updates and for public uh, the okay. discussion. Okay, let's open up public comment for everything under B enforcement program. The statistics, the update, the consultant expert program, and the um, consultants that we are possibly going to approve. This is the moderator. At the direction of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature. 
If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. Type in, I would like to make a public comment in the Ask field and send it to all panelists. Again, this is a reminder that the Q&A feature is being used only as a means for the members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. Once unmuted, the member of the public may verbally state their actual comment. And again, board president, there has been no request for verbal comments or public comments. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. It has been closed. Okay. So Kathleen, um, you want to read back um, first the motion uh, accepting. Um, okay, I, I first had a motion, Dr. Minzi, that was seconded by Mansworth, but I think the one pending now is just for the first applicant. And okay. let me see, I think I have this Mansdorf is, is the first, and you is the second. Okay, and this is and that is to accept the first applicant. Um, who is? It would be this is Brian Aislinn. It would be Dr. Glazier. Okay. Oh, Glazier is the first one. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Okay, Dr. Manzi. Uh, yes. Miss Elliott. Yes. Ms. Cadane. Yes. Dr. Mansdorf. Yes. Dr. McLoon. Yes. Dr. Zach. Yes. Okay, unanimously accepted. And now we will take the motion, uh, a motion again for the second candidate. Who would like to make that motion? This is Neil Mansdorf. I'd like to make a motion to approve Dr. Nicholas Todd for consultant to the Podiatric Medical Board of California. All right. And is there a second? McElwain will second. Okay. All right. I'll take that vote then. Dr. Manzi. Uh, yes. Ms. Elliott. Yes. Ms. Cadena. Yes. Dr. Mansdorf? Yes. Dr. McAloon? Yes. Dr. Zapp? Yes. Unanimous. Okay. Accepted uh, the second candidate. Thank you. Great. Now, we're going on to our legislative regulation program, State and Possible Action. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, again. Um, Dr. Zapp, shall I go forward, or would you like to make any comments? No, please go forward. Real quick, can I interrupt really fast? Did we make a motion for both candidates? Because I thought we were doing them individually, and I didn't hear. I didn't catch that we did Glazier and Todd. Just want to make sure. We, we did Glazier and Todd. Both of them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so as you all know, the legislative cycle that we were so excited about to get a few things through um, came to a screeching halt with the COVID-19. Two bills that we were hoping to see pass will not go forward, so they are dead for sure. They read, you know, in all of the uh, reviews as dead bills. And the first one is 1940, AB 1940, which was sponsored by by Wood and Flora. And I, I believe this was just the last part of getting uh, podiatric doctors to not have to fill uh, enrollment requirements that were not required of physicians or uh, MDs or DOs. And I'm sure this will come back in another form. But for right now, sitting separate is a separate bill that allows podiatrists the same um, application <laughs> privileges uh, for the Medi-Cal system, this is now going to be put over. So there's really no discussion on this. It's, it's very dead, 1940. 
Any comments on AB 1940? Okay. Um, AB 2203 by Nazarian, I. I believe this is very important to our licensee base because what it's saying is if you order a podiatric device to a Medi-Cal patient, it must be covered if you ordered it, it, even if it's over the counter. So this is in response to the diabetes epidemic. And I think we should, you know, send, if this passes, send something out to our members to let them know that they can tell their patients that these things must be covered. They cover a lot more, but, but the podiatric devices for your, the shoes or whatever you want them to have will be covered. Um, and that's an attachment B. And this looks really good to go forward. So um, on May 31st, it passed the first house and the co-authors are making certain revisions that won't affect the podiatric aspects of this, but um, it looks like it's going forward. So any comments on AB 2203? is something that we were seeing a few years ago, a lot of temporary, um, oh, excuse me, 2544, the fluoroscopy, as I said, was dead. It is dead. We're not going to go over it. The fluoroscopy is not going through this year. And I don't know where it's going to end up, but I know there's a motion to bring that back again, but I don't know what form it'll take. So getting on to the temporary license, the active bill, if if a podiatrist is married to an active military person, uh, if this bill goes through, we'll be obligated to con give them temporary licenses in, in a very uh, fast and, and uh, avoiding a lot of the procedural delays. Um, we would be required to adopt a regulation and add it to our regs to cover this. So there'd be a little bit of work if it passes, but um, it looks good. Um, uh, just two days ago, the co-authors revised it from the committee, and um, it looks like it's going to go through. So that's AB 2549 by The most pertinent bill to us is that trailer bill that I don't have a number for, but it does deal with the Business and Professions Code, our fee statute, 2499.5, and it looks like our fees will be finalized at 1318 for you know, if everything goes through the way we expect, Brian can address all the details of that. But if, if the language that we've seen, and as you can see attached, it covers our new fees, just like we were hoping for, and we have supported with the fee study in the sunset. So are there any questions about the trailer bill with our fee increases? Hi, this is Neil. Hi, this is Neil. Question about the uh, fee for 1918. That's not inclusive of cures, correct? Not inclusive of what? Cures? The cures fee? No, no, it's not. So and currently, cures is $12 every two years, and that's changing? I think it's changing, and Andrea knows, but it's going up. So, yeah, that would be more like, 13, you know, in the end, like 1340 or 50 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Brian Naslin. Um Dr. Mansdorf, yes. Uh, so DOJ has that fee. We we don't touch or we ha have no control over that fee whatsoever. It's a DOJ cost for the cures. So they set that new that new fee increase. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, we, we don't have control over that. DOJ does. Right. It's just when the uh, licensee looks at the fees and they see it's more than 318. Uh, they understand that it's, the additional fees are cures, but I think it lists that as a separate item. Yeah, it does, and then we'll, we'll definitely outline that on our website and, and have an explanation. Um, I know we get a couple of calls on that, so um, a nice explanation on our website would be a, a, a good source of information of why. Great, thanks. This is Carolyn McAloon. Would it be an appropriate time now to ask a question about the current budgetary process going on? Uh, this is Brian Aislinn. I, I think so. I, I think we can we can discuss it here. Um, I'd have to make sure with Fred if we're okay for that discussion because it's not agendized. Is the is the budget kind of related to the fee increase? 
Yeah, the budget. Um, so, oh. Um, no, my um, question was in regard to podiatry, but not this particular fee increase. Oh, um, if it's not on the agenda, then unfortunately, I don't believe we, uh, we you, you guys can discuss it under the Open Meeting Act. Um, and if it's not related to the fee increase, I would uh, recommend maybe put that down on the future agenda item. Will the budget process still be going in place on our next um, meeting? Or will it be a moot point by then? That's whether or not to request that it's added to the agenda. It's, uh, this is Brian Naslin. It should be going on in September. So um, as we get more information, um, we can definitely uh, pass that around to the board members and uh, identify that in the committees as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, Kathleen, um, regulatory program update. Uh, just, uh, is, uh, you're, you're done with the legislative program update yet? I hear you. I, this is Brian Nason. I don't know. Did we lose Kathy? Kathy, it looks like you're still muted. This is oh. the moderator. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry. Okay. So um, you, that's it for the legislative regulation program update, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, now, it's do you have anything else to add here? There, there's a section B under reg that we didn't go over with uh, Mr. Jackson, and it's the status update for disciplinary guidelines. Okay, let's hear that. Okay. Um, this matter has been pending. It's here because we just are addressing the board and letting them know that it is in process, progress. And we now have Fred as our new attorney, and we'll be working with him as well as Clay. Um, and our goal is to get this done <laughs> as soon as we can. It involves um, enforcement, legal, and it, there's just a lot of details in it. And that, that's all I can say about why it's taking so long. Are there any questions from any of the board members about disciplinary guidelines? Yeah, this is part of the and I could, I could put a little more guidance to this on the disciplinary guidelines. Through my tender of being here, um, disciplinary guidelines has been um, something that has kind of stalled. It gets legs, it gets stalled. Um, since I've been here, we've gone through uh, three attorneys, or actually four, right? Because we had, um, yeah, four, four attorneys. And now that we have the regulation um, legal uh, division, and that's what Clay is working on. He works only on regulations. That's gonna free up the other attorneys. So we're just trying to work with Clay. The number one priority right now is the 2138 because we have that July 1st deadline. So we need to get that uh, over to OAL so it gets approved and then we can implement that. So um, unfortunately there's other programs in DCA. So um, 2138 has taken its uh, priority. A slot, but we had um, several um, discussions with Mr. Jackson, and then all of a sudden we got hit with COVID-19. So we're we're putting it back on the agenda. We're hoping to have this done by September's meeting. So just a little update on that. And trust me, I want it off the table as well. Got it. All right, very good. Um, so so um, the legislative calendar, uh, Kathleen, do you have anything more there? Just to let you know that they did adjust some deadlines in order to accommodate the 
absence from COVID and things are moving forward, but a lot isn't going forward. If you look at a lot of the bills, you see, you know, many more than usual aren't going forward. So you can look at that calendar and then um, let us know if, if, if I guess the last part is if there's any future agenda items. Right. So is there any other future agenda items we'd like to bring up here for our next meeting? This is the moderator, board member Neil has his hands up. Oh yes, Neil. Hi Judy. Uh, Hi. One of the, uh, uh, Carolyn had a concern about the budget and I think the board should always be able to discuss budget matters. It shouldn't have to be put off to another board meeting. I think on our agenda, especially under executive management, that we have a standing order for budget discussion or budget review. Thank you. Yes, so, is uh, um, I, I would just like to make a comment on that because I get the reports from DCA. As soon as we get updates, we include them in board reports. Within the last three months, we haven't gotten any, so we didn't include them because the last information we have is what you've seen. My comment was Carolyn had a question about budget, and sometimes you have to be able to react quickly and shouldn't have to postpone till September to discuss something. So there should always be the ability to discuss budgetary items at every board meeting. And this is so a standing, yeah, a standing financial item. I get it. Okay. This is Fred. This is Fred from BCA. I see that on item E2, there is a review of the proposed fee increase and update on the PMBC fund condition. So maybe that item can be discussed under, uh, under that subsection. Which is, I guess, in uh, Okay, then we can have Dr. McAloon uh, address that later. Yeah, at that time. But, but my okay. comment would be that we always have a standing order to discuss budgetary issues if there is a question. Thank you. You're, that's a good point. Okay. Uh, so uh, the legislative calendar, as you see, is attached, and then. Um, do we have any suggestions of agenda items in future meeting days? Okay, so now we need to have a motion to approve this, um, everything that was under section C here with our legislative re regulation program. Um, Dr. Mancy, you know, in the past, what we've done with all of these reports is wait till Brian gives the exec and then take all the reports and accept them with one motion. I mean, there's no motion pending for action other than accepting the report, right? Okay, so then I'll ask the question, is this the time, do we need to open now this for public comment before we go on to public education? Uh, yes, Madam President. Okay, fine. So would this be an appropriate time? Yes. Yes. All right. Could we please open up public comment for anything regarding legislative reg regulation program, please? This is the moderator. I have opened the Q&A on the direction of the board in public. If you would like to submit a public comment, please type in. I would like to make a public comment in the ask field and send it to all panelists. Again, once you submit your request, we will call on you and you can provide your verbal comment to the board. Board President, there have been no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please close the Q&A feature. Thank you very much. You're and welcome. going to move on to Darlene. Good morning. Public education update and possible action. Hello. Uh, good afternoon or, or good morning, everybody. Um, this is Darlene Trujillo Elliott. Um, can you hear me? I hope. Okay. Yes, yeah, can hear you, Darlene. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, so public education program report, um, uh, the action today is basically a receive and file. Uh, the recommendation today was the discussion and possible action regarding the PMBC's newsletter, website, social media accounts, and the PMBC's outreach activities. The issue um, summarizes uh, recent activities regarding the publication of the newsletter, web activities, and direct communications with stakeholders. Um, one of the discussions and possible actions regarding publishing footnotes was reducing the publication to once a year. The board newsletter footnotes is currently published two times per year. Each new newsletter publication has provided information and coverage for the current trends regarding many of the issues that are of concern to the PMBC's licensees, board members, staff, and stakeholders. Um, at the March 6, 2020 board meeting, which seems like a lifetime ago, the board um, discussed um, the publications or the publication schedule was discussed and uh, quite a, uh, a bit of discussion um, and talked about the, the focusing of the newsletter um, and the issues surrounding the healthcare professionals and quite a few other topics. Um, I lost my place. It was um, worthwhile um, for the board to give further direction to the publication schedule and focus the the board's uh, newsletter on footnotes. Um, and then the second item was a suggestion of agenda items and future meeting dates with regards to our public education. Um, and I'm not too sure what the number two item was, Kathleen, if you could um, chime in and maybe uh, add some context to the number two. Okay, um, I think it, it number two is just any future ideas about our outreach program, right. what we might be able to do other than the newsletter with this item one. So if there's any questions regarding this report, um, the, I have no questions regarding the report. I just have a comment, um, and, and it's just uh, about the fact that, you know, the newsletter, there's the online presence of the newsletter that everyone can look at online, and then there's the one that we were actually printing, and it was kind of sitting around the Capitol, correct? But correct. Now that no one's really sitting around the Capitol, and, you know, it, there is some expense uh, attached to this newsletter, uh, possibly think about not printing it as much as just getting it online. I see. That's a good idea. So less print copies and more focus on the online version. Uh -huh. Exactly. That would be my recommendation. Okay. Anybody else have comments? Oh, this is Brian Naslin. So on uh, the discussion of possible action regarding publishing footnotes once a year, do you want to take action on that and just uh, set that that we would just continue to do it once a year? Or to hold off and, and try to do uh, our social media more, more uh, effort towards social media and so we're not just layering two different work tablets together. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I would take the vote that we do one of these once a year, but uh, or suggested. I don't know if we need a vote on it, whatever. But um, the thing though about social media, you know, yeah, I noticed some of these other websites that have you know, support. What do you have to say? You know, um, APB, you know, the American Board of Podiatric Medicine or DPMs today or whatever, you know, this uh, takes a, a lot of thought and energy and effort as to what it would be the content, you know, that if we had a presence on social media, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, and, you know, uh, how I don't know, liable could we be for some of the things we put up there? Um, this would, I think, need to be staff first to be sure 
who we're doing on social media is specifically okay. So I think all those things need to be thought out very carefully before we do a big launch on social media. But I think that a presence on social media, we should have a discussion as what are we trying to accomplish with it. Well, and um, to add to that, because we didn't have our um, committee meetings before this meeting, um, there was at the last meeting quite a few discussions uh, about reducing it. And so right now, because of COVID, I, I do believe that our um, online presence is more important. And what I would suggest, um, and I'll say if, uh, if we have a motion or if we want to discuss it, is maybe actually delaying this vote so the committee could go back and look at this a little bit more and then make um, further recommendations for our next meeting. I think that's a great idea and we can get a plan together. Right. Okay. All right. So Neil, you have a question? Yeah, hi. Right. Um, this is Neil Mansdorf. I do think members of the public and licensees are interested in the enforcement program. It might be nice sending out an email to interested parties regarding enforcement activities, maybe biannually. Uh, so it doesn't need to be a publication. It can just be a, an email to licensees and other interested parties regarding recent actions by the board, maybe every six months. Uh, it's often one of the things, the first things that people read with the uh, Medical Board of California is what are licensees doing, what were they uh, sanctioned against, and what they shouldn't be doing. So that's just a thought. It would be a little extra work for Bethany, but it wouldn't be a, a printed publication. Thank you, Neil. No, I will. I wrote that down, and um, I'm going to ask Kathleen if she could put that on our agenda for our next committee meeting to discuss. Okay, so um, our suggestion for the future um, meeting will be just this. Um, what should we be publishing? How frequently should we be publishing? And um, in what manner do we want to publish? Does that sound right? And I apologize for the interruption. This is a moderator. Board um, staff Bethany has her hand up. Okay, Bethany, what do we got? Yes, I just wanted to comment quickly that I had started um, doing, it was monthly email updates or as we had actions passed um, to the, um, everybody that had signed up to receive emails from our board. Mm -hmm. uh, from our listserv, and it got a little bit behind since COVID, but I am planning on continuing that and hope to get an um, update out this month. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, is this the time for public comment? Yes, Madam President. All right. Can we open up uh, public comment, please? Regarding. Did, I'm sorry. Did we? Did we have a motion first? Oh. Uh, this is Fred. If the um, if the item that we just talked about is that your agenda item, you don't need a motion for that. Okay. Um, however, there is I don't know what the board wants regarding the public uh, the item regarding publishing the footnotes. So if no action is to be taken, then you don't need a motion for that too. Because literally, the board is not taking any action. So, as I understand this, you'd like a motion for no action to be taken and then open up the public comment? Uh, um, sorry, I, I, uh, sorry, Madam President. No, uh, what I meant is, is the board um, is not, that is not, does not want to take any action on item B1. It does not need a motion. It just doesn't, there's just nothing to do. Usually you move, if uh, you make a motion whenever the board will like to take action on it. Item. That's when you you, um, uh, you do the motion. So, if at this instance right now, um, the board does not want this one to be the status quo regarding the items uh, about the publishing the footnotes, it does not need a motion. Right. So we could just open public comment regarding 
our um, public education program. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Could we open that up, please, to public comment? Yes. This is the moderator. I have opened the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, please submit, I would like to make a public comment by typing it in the question box and sending it to all panelists. We do have it displayed on the screen for your reference. Again, the Q&A feature is just being used as a means for the members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. Once unmuted, the member of the public may verbally state their actual comment. And I will pause now to allow the public, member of the public, time to access the Q&A feature. Board President, no requests were submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. And just a friendly reminder, when you're not speaking, board members, board panelists, um, board staff, um, if you can please mute your mic, I have been hearing some feedback from the unmuted mics and I have been muting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's move on now to the executive management update. Um, so this is regarding our sunset review. As you know, it's gotten kind of postponed. So I'm going to let Brian um, tell you what's going on with this. Okay, Brian Naslin, executive officer. So our sunset review hearing has been extended until next year. Um, I'm not sure when or what date that would be for our hearing for next year, but they're um, going to try to lump everybody that is going through sunset next year to try to take everybody that was going through sunset this year and try to figure out some type of schedule uh, to go through these hearings. So the big, the big things of uh, our, our sunset were two ask, right? One was the um, probation disclosure to get that amended, that statute amended. Uh, for us to be or DPMs to be included in MDs and DOs on the probation disclosure. Um, as I said earlier, um, they're not hearing that on the Senate side. Um, we're looking at other avenues on the assembly side, but um, it just depends on, um, you know, the, the aroma over there. It, everything is COVID-19 related uh, bills. So um, I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. So. We're still uh, we're still investigating that pathway to see if we can get this into a bill. Um, the other one was the, um, and we'll go down to number two, was the proposed fee increase. Um, that was in our sunset, right? We needed to uh, increase our fees to thirteen eighteen um, to make a, a a solid fund condition, right? A solvent but fund condition. And that would allow us to basically uh, increase the fees and through uh, probably about a four to five year period of time, it would have put us in anywhere between uh, 12 month um, to 18 month reserve. And that's right where we wanna be. I think the board did uh, approve that. They would like to see a, a, a fund condition with a reserve of 12 months. So, um, with that trailer bill going on, um, so it's a it's a budgetary trailer bill, something a little bit different than a regular bill. The Department of Finance is sponsoring that, and we don't know if it's going to stick or not, or we haven't heard anything, but it has been included. Podiatric medicine has been included to uh, have their fees increased to 1318. So I'll just have to keep you guys posted as that piece of legislation goes down its pathway. Now, are there any questions on the fund condition? The fund condition right now is we're still waiting for information. I would imagine it's still the same as what we were. We're probably about five months in reserve. So I think we're going to be fine. That was the projection in the fee study, um, but it's going to start to decrease in 2021. That's why we're doing the fee increase to get that fund reserve back up. So I don't know if Dr. McLoon wanted to bring anything about her question about the budget here. Uh, 
Thank you. So my question just for clarity was not for the um, board's budget, but in regards to the budget, um, the governor's budget in the legislature, uh, how it affects our licensees. Well, right now, what I know is the May revise went out, right? And due to the COVID-19 and the extra expenses, I don't think there's going to be any hit to the Podiatric Medicines Fund. Um, we are self-sufficient. Our licensees uh, fund the board, so we're not included in any general funds or anything like that. So I think we're going to be okay. I was speaking to regard to the um, recently um, putting Padachi back into Medi-Cal and the budget being submitted that removes us again. Right. I think that those bills were um, postponed at this point. Okay. Thank you for that. That was mm -hmm. basically my question. <laughs> okay. What was the status of that particular item? Yeah. Very fluid right now over there. Very fluid. So, um, well, as soon as information I get from uh, the legislature or DCA's legal or um, DCA's legislature, um, I'll keep everybody informed of that process. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. Uh huh. And does anybody else have any other questions on that? Okay. So the last item is a discussion and maybe possible action. Um, the reopening of the office, the office is still closed. We're still on a telecommute schedule. We have one person in the office uh, per day, um, and we're running that schedule until um, we're notified um, differently. Now, the discussion is, is I'm thinking as we start to reopen um, to still have the telecommute, we've already had the telecommute uh, program set up. Um, we seem to be very efficient with it. Um, everybody has their laptops. Um, we could do work. I'm thinking about once we start reopening, um, having staff in there twice a week in three-day uh, telecommute. And as we start to reopen, reopen, what's that phase three and four? Um, and then we'll just gradually work into uh, full operation. So does anybody have any discussion or any ideas or um, any thoughts on that? All right, I guess not. So I'll go ahead and uh, still continue what we're doing and uh, wait for the, uh, the reopening, what those disclosures are gonna be, and we'll go from there. And I'll keep everybody posted. Uh, once I get those instructions. Okay. okay. Music, that's all I have for executive management. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. Um, so since there's no action being taken here, we could open a public discussion just for comment on this section. Is that correct? Yes. Madam President? Yeah. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I missed what you said. Well, there's no action being taken, but should we open now public comment for any public comment regarding what Mr. Naslin had to say? Yes, please. Okay. So could we open public comment, please? This is the moderator. At the direction of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment, please type, I would like to make a comment in the ask question field and submit it to all panelists. I'll pause for a moment. And again, I do have the instructions on the screen for you to reference. Board President, no requests were submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. It has been closed. Okay. Um, so we, we're going to go now uh, into closed session unless everyone needs a break. Okay. So this is what we can do here um, on the closed session. This is Brian Mason again. Um, what we can do is we can finish out the open session 
That means okay. we wouldn't have to come back into open session. Uh, the board members, the attorney, uh, Fred and Kathleen Cooper will be on the closed session. Um, and you guys can just call in that bridge line, I think opens up. You can start calling in at 1215 and, um, and then you can go into your closed session. Once you're done with your, uh, closed session, um, deliberations and uh, make your, uh, your votes, um, then you'd be concluding the meeting from there. Brian, do, do we have to have a motion to accept your executive director report, right? to accept all of them, you know, enforcement, licensing, ledge, exact? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. okay. Um, Thanks, Kathy. So let's, mm -hmm. let's do that. Okay, so, um, so therefore, um, we did the public comment. So may I have a motion to accept um, Brian's um, uh, executive management um, report? This is Maria Cadena. So moved. Thank you. Michael's up second. Thank you. Okay. Wait, I'm sorry. It was Maria first, and who? Who? Beth. Dr. Okay. Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So I will take your vote now. Uh, Dr. Mandy. Aye. Ms. Elliott. Aye. Ms. Cadena. Aye. Dr. Mansdorf. Aye. Dr. McAloon. Aye. Dr. Zant. Aye. Okay, so the reports are accepted. Thank you. Okay, I would like to move on to our open session uh, where we'll talk about future agenda item, items. And after that, we will adjourn and the closed session will begin. So uh, let's open the open session. Does anyone have um, any future agenda items they would like to discuss here? Okay. Um, moderated, do you see anybody's hands up? Because I can't yes. see. Okay. Yes, board member Darlene. Okay. Has hand. Darlene. Hello again. Um, well, I, I don't know. Um, with COVID-19, I just wanted to see if staff had any recommendations, maybe on uh, or Brian of what they anticipate is going to be happening. Um, I know we talked about the telecommuting, but also with lag time with um, other divisions and departments we work closely with. Um, uh, again, the communication, um, if he foresees any roadblocks and also um, even on our application and licensing, um, has staff heard or uh, received any questions regarding around COVID-19? Um, did you want that on the future agenda item? Because I'd, I'd have to go to Fred again to see if um, we can have that discussion here. So okay. But we can definitely put it in, um, into the agenda. And um, I can always provide you uh, written right. updates. So. Um, well, and, and maybe it just needs to go to the committee and then we can decide what that looks like if it needs to go to board, but just okay. trying to anticipate any, again, roadblocks the, for, yeah. What, what the, the future uh, looks like, right? Exactly, what the future looks exactly. like and, and all the stumbling blocks, it's going to, it's going right. to um, occur. And, and so. we have to be very fluid right now. I think everybody is kind of, again, waiting for the next shoe to drop. Um, right. And, uh, <laughs> Right. Okay. We'll add that. And um, like I said, I'll give you uh, written updates to all board members and take it to a uh, committee. Hey, Brian. It's Fred yeah. from uh, DCA Legal. Hey, I'm looking at the um, at the Open Meeting Act here, requiring that I guess we go back into open session. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the governor has suspended that uh, requirement because obviously I think that requirement was meant for. Um, physical meeting and not virtual meeting like this. Uh, so yeah. anyway, just FYI, um, there, is a, there is a requirement. But I'm not sure whether um, that. Yeah, that, from what I understand, other boards have been doing this when they have closed session as well. Um, okay. They run through the um, the agenda, then everybody doesn't have to jump back on web. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's such a pain. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that requirement would work well for. 
for these type of meetings. So, I mean, if other boards been doing it, then I you know I just want to bring it up. Okay. Yeah, thank that's what I've been hearing. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I I have um something that possibly for a future agenda item, but I don't know um, you know if this should go to committee first or not, but. The idea that um, we have these 19 residency programs in the state and the idea that, you know, the the biggest chunk of our budget comes out of, um, you know, our disciplinary, you know, work. Um, Would it be of any benefit to um, communicate with the residency program directors? Let them know that, you know, we're happy that they have their robust and the schools actually that are in the state of California. And I would just keep this to the state of California, obviously, and that we are, you know, happy that we have this robust educational process going on in our state since we are the board that oversees this. And that, you know, if, you know, like, you know, it's sort of almost like a mission statement that the program, to, I don't know if we suggest it to the program or whatever, but, you know, somehow let them communicate to their residents, you know, the, um, you know, there is an ethical piece to this whole thing. And there is this whole, like, legis- you know, this be a good citizen or a be a whatever, just to kind of, like, let them know what we, you know, who we are, what we're doing, not that they don't know, but they let the residents know, you know, it's more of an education to the people they're educating regarding the Board of Podiatric Medicine. This is Brian Nazan again. Um, I think it's a good one for the license committee to frame it out before we agendize it on, um, on a full board meeting. Okay. Just we could do a little more legwork and kind of polish how that report would look like and what type of feedback we do get from the directors. So I think a, a licensing um, committee would be a good uh, start for this suggestion. So I'd like to ask my board members to contact us, the licensing committee, um, if you have any um, feeling on, you know, yeah, this is a great idea. Maybe do it this way or that way. Or if you know of any other, I guess, I. Um, ways that this maybe has been approached. So that's all I have to say. Okay. All right. So um, do we have anything else? If not, I'm going to have someone please make an emotion or I could make an emotion to adjourn. And before everybody adjourns, I just want to make sure that um, the closed session again starts. I think you can call in at 1215. The actual time says 1230, but I think there is a 15 minute grace period on both the uh, start and end time. So I think uh, you have 15 minutes um, once you close Where? the open session. Where is the number to call? I can send it to you if you don't have it. Um, it should have been emailed to you. I'll go look for it. Maybe hang on. This is the board moderator. I apologize for interrupting. I just wanted to ensure that um, did we open it for public comment for the future agenda items? No, we can do that now. Um, go ahead and open it for future agenda items. Thank you. The Q&A feature has been open. Members of the public, if you're interested in and submitting a request for public comment, type in, I would like to make a public comment in the question box and submit it to all panelists. The instructions are on the screen. Again, if you submit a request, we will call on you and mute your microphone and you will have the ability to give your verbal um, comments or question to the board and the board staff. Board President, no requests were submitted. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. It has been closed. Okay. Um, Madam President, this is Fred, DCA Legal. You don't need a motion to adjourn the meeting. Oh, okay. I can just adjourn the meeting. All right. So before I adjourn the meeting, I want everyone to be sure they know that in 15 minutes, we're coming back to a closed session. Does everyone have the link or do they need it resent? Uh, out to everyone? No. 
you don't have the link. You, so you'd like us to send you the link to get back into this. Correct, Mike? This is Brian Anson. Just to be clear again, this is not a WebEx. This is a regular um, teleconference, just like we would do in our uh, committee meetings. Right. So it's just a phone number. And it should have come in your, uh, Mike, if you're looking for it, it came in a separate email, actually. And as the packets of the people that we will be discussing is in. So Brian, if you could resend that to Dr. Zapp, that'd be great. Anybody else need that resent to them? Or whoever sent that out? Okay, good. All right, so with that being said, I'd like to adjourn this meeting. So um, thanks everybody for our really historic um, meeting here. And um, um, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your assistance. Thank you. All right. Everyone have a good day, and I'll meet the rest of you back in uh, 1215 on the phone. All right? All right, All right everybody. Thank right. you. Great. Thank you. You guys Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. This is the moderator. This concludes the board meeting. I will now close the WebEx session.